Spoon today is covering the use of the TTRPG platform Roll20 to create virtual crime scenes. So a few of you may have some very initial questions here. The first of all may be, what is a TTRPG and what is Roll20? So a TTRPG is a tabletop role playing game. So the one that you're most likely to be familiar with is Dungeons and Dragons. So what TTRPGs do, and what they are, is they're a type of game that allows for group activity with thoughts and actions being heavily described through speech. And what Roll20 is, is Roll20.net, the actual website, is what we call a virtual tabletop. So this is our website that contains a whole host of tools that facilitate the remote playing of TTRPGs. Another important aspect for Roll20 is that it also allows for free account creation. So it should be accessible to all of your users. And it's also um, extremely friendly in, in the free account for the creation of what we're gonna be doing today. So what I'm going to be doing today is actually moving across to Roll20 and showing you some tips and tricks for creating your own virtual crime scene using this platform, should you want to roll this out yourself. Now there's a whole wide variety of advantages for using something like a tabletop RPG to create a crime scene, or certainly at least to create a virtual crime scene. And one of these is this text space and this kind of the speech aspect to it. So users have to verbalize their thoughts and actions. So this allows for feedback both from tutors and from peers and allows for improving things like communication skills. But because we're using this virtual platform, which is going to give us some really interesting visual tools that we can use as well, it acts as a gateway for those who perhaps are not as familiar with tabletop role playing games. And um, so it gives them something visual to look at, to interact with, which helps them engage. And it also is really helpful for a lot of users to be able to have their own little character within this space that they can control and move around the crime scene to help put them in that mindset. So what I'm going to do now is jump across to Roll20 and I'm going to take you through the creation of a virtual crime scene. So here we have the Roll20 landing page. So I've signed into my own account here. And what we're going to do is we want to start a new game. So I'm just going to call this game Remote Forensic CSI and tell the system that I am ready and I want to create a game. So when we first create our game, this is the screen you'll see here. So we're gonna start off just with this settings button here. And in here we have four different options, game settings, copy game, clear chat archive, and delete game. Now copy game is useful if you make something that's extremely useful and you want to reuse it with different groups. Instead of having to create it all again from scratch, you can simply copy the game and assign new users. Clear the chat archive is useful if you're using the same one over again and you're wanting to clear any messages that have been typed in the chat, which may help other groups um, if they don't want that help beforehand. And obviously delete game um, is to delete the actual map itself. And that does have a confirmation box. So don't worry about accidentally clicking that one. But where we're going to start is in game settings just very quickly. Now, thankfully, there's very few settings that I want to change here um, initially. But in the game default settings, I do have a couple of recommendations. And um, if you are particularly concerned about the size of each grid, the default is five foot per grid, but you can change this. I would also recommend you keep it square, but perhaps change the measurement system to something like a Euclidean distance instead. And I would also recommend you enable this thing called fog of war. Um, so this means that players will initially not be able to see things but you can reveal them to them. And I feel this gives a real good aspect to the game and will demonstrate how Fog of War can be utilized. So those are the main settings I would say. So you want to save those. And then you want to save those changes. So from there, we just click back and this will bring us back to this screen. So now we're ready to start creating. So we want to tell it to launch the game. Players won't be able to join the game until you are happy with it and you share with them the link which is available through the launch game. So we'll begin to launch our game and create our virtual crime scene now. 
So now that we've launched the game, you notice a few things as a default. First of all, that there's now a picture and a video and an audio feed live through this website. So your users can change this. They can turn off or turn on their videos. They can mute and unmute their microphones as well. So dealing with these pictures is probably the first thing we want to consider and settings can be found in the top right corner. So here you can do things like change your name, but the setting I'm going to be most interested in just now is this player video avatar size. And I would suggest you use small or simply use names only. But I think small works quite well for the time being. And I would certainly suggest you allow them to remain player controlled in terms of being movable. So then people can move them out of their way as they need to. Now, when we first come in, one of the first things we notice is that we're quite zoomed in and this is at the default 100%. I quite like to zoom out a little bit just as I get started, just to give me a little bit extra space to play with. So we'll start with these tools on the left hand side. So most oftentimes you want to have your select move tool and this is this very top option up here. So if you're ever finding that you're struggling to select anything, just make sure you come back to here. This next box down is our different layers. Now there's three different layers within Roll20. Okay, this map and background layer at the top, this is where all players can see these items, but cannot click or move or interact with them in any way. So most of your building of your environment is going to be through this map and background layer. Objects and tokens are visible to all players and can be moved. So I would suggest that only things that you really have on your objects and token layer are things like controllable characters for your students and any objects that you specifically want them to be able to click, drag, resize, etc. So I think very few items really will go into this objects and tokens. This third layer is called the GM Info Overlay and GM in this context stands for Game Master. Because remember this platform is designed for tabletop role playing games. So in this layer, it is only visible to you as the creator. Your users and players cannot see this information. So I would suggest you use this layer for giving yourself hints, scripts, background information, key prompts for yourself in creation of your crime scene. So use that to your best advantage. We're going to be doing most of our building in this map and background layer. This next one down, you're probably quite familiar with from other programs, but it's like drawing shapes, free hands, drawing lines and text. So again, use those as you see fit. This, uh, we're not necessarily too concerned about the zoom at the moment, but this tool here can be very useful. And this is a measurement tool. So as I said before, in the game settings before you actually start, you can change what size these grids are. They default to being five foot by five foot. What this means that if you say no snapping, and I would suggest that you encourage people to use no snapping, but do show to others, you can drag and click along and it will show you the length. Okay? So this is useful for if you're wanting to measure things like rooms or check your dimensions are, are realistic. Should anyone want to take any measurements within your crime scene? Now this next tool here controls what I call, the, or what is called, not I call, the fog of war. So when fog of war is enabled, you as the controller, as the game master, can see everything. What the fog of war does is it hides it to your players. So what I would suggest, and what I certainly quite like, is to have the areas hidden to my players until they physically move their token towards the boundaries of those hidden areas. Then I can reveal areas to them and make it feel that they're actually seeing things for the first time instead of them just being able to take in everything at once. So this allows you to kind of drip feed and um, kind of information to them a little bit, stop them being overwhelmed. So we'll come back and apply this tool towards the end. We don't need to concern ourselves with this turn timer. Obviously, we're not going to be playing turn based and we shouldn't be needing to roll any dice. So we don't need to concern ourselves with that. So like I say, we're going to be doing most of our building, making sure we are in the map and background area. So that's where we're going to start. And we want to make sure we have our select and move tool selected. Now, there are different ways that you can get maps and different backgrounds to work on. There obviously are some that you can find in the system and that is performed using the search option in this art library in the top right corner here. If you want to look for maps and things, I would suggest changing it to maps, tiles and textures. And again, you can search for key terms within there. 
Now, bear in mind, this is a tabletop RPG system used for things like Dungeons and Dragons. So a lot of the maps you're going to find will be things like dungeons. OK, so what I would suggest is that you either create your own resources using tools like Magic Plan or find yourself some really interesting outdoor areas through things like Google Earth, if you want to use Google Earth or find yourself some good copyright free floor plan images. And I quite like to find some of these in terms of 3D ones and keep a little library of these. And um, so these are really useful for future reference again. So in terms of maps, I would certainly suggest you find some others to import in yourself, but by all means, have a look through those little maps and tile sections. But what is likely to be much more useful and what I found I use all the time is the token search. So tokens are things that you're going to put on your maps. So these are going to be things that add extra flavor. There'll be things like your player controlled characters. There'll be things like the evidence that you're hiding in the crime scene, for example. So you can search for different terms within here and you can search for anything you can think of, really. So one that we'll just start with is searching for blood. OK, so I'll do a little search and you'll see that I've already got some results from my library. You won't have your own library built just yet, so I'm just going to hide that option for now. Similarly, there are also premium assets, but you don't need to pay. We're using a free plan here. And um, so at the moment, we're just going to hide the premium assets. But what we do have are lots of different options from the web. OK, so any of these can be dragged and dropped onto your play area. OK, and from there, they can be resized. They can be moved. They can be rotated however you see fit. What you can also do with these is you can right click on them and copy them to your own library or into your own folders. And this is something I would suggest you do is to create your own library with some subset folders so that you have a good little um, build up of items that you can continually come back to instead of having to search for them over and over again. And when we don't want these, we can simply highlight them and delete them and they will be removed from the area. We'll also have some free assets available to us as well. So in the premium asset tab, there is a little free assets button. Some of them are useful, some of them will be less so. So by all means, have a little flick through those, see if there's any that are useful and that you want to add to your own library. But what we'll do now is have a quick look at the library itself. Now you can download images and upload different images in here. And certainly this is something I would suggest you have a play around with particularly for things like your floor plans and your maps. You'll find them much more usable um, for the purposes that we're going to be using. So within here, I've also created some subfolders for myself um, just to kind of help categorize things. So I've got things like set dressing items. So these are things that I can just pop on top of my map to add a little bit of flavor, to create different scenes, to give them different things to consider. So I've got things like a variety of different cars, some cordons, different trucks, little fire pits, suitcases, etc. My next tab I've created is called PCs and NPCs, and this is where essentially I put any human characters. And um, so NPCs being non-player characters and PCs being player characters. So these would be things like my little CSI tokens and um, bodies at the crime scene and things like that. Evidence will be things that I commonly use for evidences. So these would be things like different firearms, tools, ammunition, different blood spatters, etc. So again, a variety of those that you can create and do just spend a little bit of time having a look through searching for different terms. Sometimes think a little bit outside the box and build yourself that little um, that little collection that you can quickly refer back to just for dragging and dropping things. And this last one here is floor plans. So this is where I'm storing my floor plans. So in here we have different floor plans. So I'm just going to take this little three bed plain floor plan and drag that on. And this is going to be our starting point for this. So at the moment we can see it's quite small, but again, we can move this and scale it to whatever size we want it to be. And we can work on it from there. Again, because this is in the map and background section, everyone is going to be able to see it, but only you as the creator can move it around and rescale it. So you don't need to worry about your students accidentally clicking and moving anything. OK, so we'll just set this up at the top in the center here for now. Again, we can use things like our measurement tools so we can select our measurement tools and we can do things like take dimensions of the room so we can see it's approximately 12 feet wide by 13 feet long. OK, so again, your users can also use those measurement tools as well. So now we've got a basic floor plan we can start to add into this and we can start to personalize it for whatever crime we're wanting to set. 
and we can also add some different bits of flavor to this as well. So we can, for example, have a, a car that sits outside. Okay, so I can, take, I can take a little red car and I can drag this outside the premises. Okay, and again, I can stretch it and resize it to whatever size I want it to be. And we can have that sitting out. So that can be sat there. We can also then start to bring in some NPCs in terms of some different people that are going to be at this scene. Okay, so let's um, say, for example, we have a body that's been found on the floor with a bottle in their hands. So again, we can drag this and rescale this to any size that we want it to be. Okay, we can also potentially have another body in this bedroom up here. So again, we can just drag and drop that. And we can do a rescale and pop them across on that bed for now. And then we can have one final body up in this bedroom up here. And again, we can rotate this round, rescale and drag to where it's going to be most useful. So again, all of these objects will be visible at the moment to you and your users. But we can hide some of them with the fog of war later. Similarly, we're going to put some evidences around here as well. So we can have things like, oops. So we'll put some things like some blood and some weapons around the scene too. So we could add, say, a blood pool under this individual. Okay, so we can rescale this, we can drag it. We can also change the layers of things so we can move this person to the top. So we'll bring them to the front layer so that the blood is underneath them then. Like that. Again, we can add some more blood pools. We can put some blood pools under this individual. Again, we'll just make sure to move them to the front so that the blood then sits behind them like this. Again, we can drag that. And then perhaps we could put something like some footprints in blood, again, leading through the hallway potentially. So again, we'll just drag that there for now, rotate it around, and then just put those there. And we can either elongate them or we could copy them and paste them in as well. And again, then just put those down where we need those to be. And then in this final room, let's just put like a little handgun there. So again, place that item, drag it down, and we can place that in the room. Now, a lot of these you will want your students to be able to see as soon as they enter the room. If you don't, so say for this example, this handgun, if we don't want it to be visible, perhaps we want it to be under the bed for some reason. We can keep this hidden for a short period of time. So we can right click and we can move it to a layer and we can move it to the GM layer, which means that we visible to us, but not visible to our users until we move it back to either the map or the token layer. So this is a way for you to be able to hide evidences that you want your users to specifically search for. Now, the only thing with that is that if you want to then interact with that object and move it again, you need to make sure that you then change back to your GM layer. So you're essentially working on the right layer there. So we'll hide that piece of evidence for now and we'll leave the rest visible. So now you've got your basic crime scene set up. So now we need some characters in this crime scene. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my NPCs tab, okay, and I'm going to find some player characters. I'm going to find some little CSIs. So I'm going to drag myself some little CSIs down here. I'm going to make them just one square by one square, and I'm going to copy these and paste them. Okay, so I'm just going to make some extra copies of these guys. So I'm going to create four CSIs, so I can have four players here. So at the moment, you as the creator can move these around, and as um, at a default, when your players come in, they won't be able to move these around. They'll just be able to see them for now. If we want the players to be able to move them, what we do is we double click on them and we'll see this little option come up. OK, so in here we can give them names. OK, so we can give them whatever little name we want. So we'll call this little guy Joe. We can give them a nameplate and we can also say controlled by. Now, at the moment, we have all players and we have just myself. When you have your students join or your other users join the session, their name will be added to this list. So you can assign them this little CSI and that will give them control over that little CSI. But what we want to make sure we do is we want to make sure that these all move to what we call the token layer. So on the token layer, this means that they can be seen and interacted with by your users. So now we're just gonna move back to the objects and token layer. And again, we can see those now have moved up, so we can just move those along. Now, before I bring in my users, 
okay, and I'm just going to act as myself as a user. What I want to do is I want to hide this scene so that they don't get too much of a clue as they come in. So I'll just quickly select these, get rid of these guys. We'll just keep little Joe there for now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hide the scene from Joe. So I'm going to go into this little cloud and I'm going to select hide areas. Okay, so all of that area okay, is going to become dark to Joe. Okay? So he's not going to be able to see anything other than the car. Okay, it's going to ask me if I want to turn on fog of war. Yes, I want to turn on the fog of war. If your scene does what mine does and it's just hidden everything, what you can do is use this little reveal areas icon. Okay, and any of these areas then that become white, Joe will be able to see by default. Whereas any of these areas in cloud, Joe will not be able to see. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll jump across to Joe and I will show you how this looks to Joe. So how I invite users is I go into this little tab up here and I hover over this box and it will give me a link to ask to join players. Okay, so I can copy this link okay, and I can then send that to my users, in this case, Joe. So I'll now jump across to Joe and show you what Joe sees from his point of view. So you'll see I'm now in two places at once. So I'm still signed in on my other account under myself and I've jumped into this account as a little person called Joe. So as you can see, as the player here, I have got the fog of war on my screen. So I can only see those areas that have been revealed to me by the creator. So if I jump back to the creator screen again and reveal more areas, we'll then come back and see what it looks like on Joe's side. OK, so I'll choose to reveal some extra areas. OK, so I'll reveal this section and I'll reveal the very front of the house to Joe. And then we'll go back and see what it looks like to them. OK, so now we can see that area has become revealed. So what I can also do is then give Joe control of this little character. And then if I jump back to my creator side of things and okay, make sure I'm using my select tool, double click, got nameplate of Joe, and I can say, right, Joe, you can control this character now. So I'll save that setting. OK, so now Joe has control of this, but I as game manager also maintain control of them. So we'll jump back across to being Joe and we can see Joe now has this little character and Joe can move this character around the scene and they can rotate themselves around as they see fit. And so I'll just move my camera just a little bit. There you go. So they can come in and rotate themselves around as they want to. And Joe could say to me, he says, I want to enter this room. And I say, OK. So I come back across to this screen and I choose to reveal areas. And I say, OK, if you enter this room, this is what you see. And I can reveal this area to Joe. And then if I jump across back to Joe, we can now see that that area has become revealed and Joe can step inside and investigate this area and assess the scene. Joe can then take any measurements that they want to. OK, so they can say that the body is approximately 13 feet from that wall and approximately eight feet from that wall, for example. Joe can then progress through the scene a little bit more. OK, so he can move along here. OK, so they see some footprints so they can continue. And I can continue to reveal areas as we move along. So they can say they want to see along there. I can reveal that area to them and they can see these footprints in blood. And all of this time they can be verbalizing to me what the actions are they're taking, why they're taking them, what thought processes they're doing. So there's that opportunity for feedback there. OK, so for now, I'm just going to reveal all of this area. OK, so I'm just going to open up everything there. And again, we can see that's reflected on Joe's screen. OK, now what we can see on Joe's screen okay, is as they enter this room here, Okay, they can see the body that's present there. Okay, they can see that already. That's on the token there, but they can't see anything else. But when we go back to our side, we can see that there is a hidden piece of evidence there. So we can question Joe what they want to do here. And if one of the things they want to do is to have a thorough search or to look under the bed for anything, then we can choose to reveal these other things to them. So we can move to the GM layer okay, where this object is. We can make sure we've got our select tool and we can then select this item and right click and move it to the token layer or move it to the map layer if we are satisfied that they have said, I want to search this particular area. So now I've moved this to the map layer, we'll jump back across to being Joe and we can see now this object has appeared on their map. So this has been revealed to them and they have now reaped the reward of this. And at the end, Joe can move to the side and Joe can finish up whatever Joe wants to do. So I'll just jump back across to my creator screen now and I'm very aware that I'm running out of time. So those are certainly some of the biggest tips 
and some of the the kind of hints I would give you if you're wanting to use these tools for yourself. Roll20 does provide a tutorial and um, that gives you a very good walkthrough of a whole variety of other tools as well. So if there's anything there that you um, haven't had covered here today or anything that you want to dig further uh, into at all, by all means, just have a play around with the Roll20 itself. Um, but thank you very much. I hope you have found this useful. Um, and I will certainly be happy to jump into the main chats now and take any questions. Or if anyone has any questions, please feel free to get in touch with me, rory.simmons at cumbria.ac.uk. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Rory. That was really interesting and great to see um, an active tutorial about how we would actually go about um, creating this content. And um, so I'd really like to hear a little bit more from you, um, if that's OK, about yeah. you know, how you've utilised this in teaching and kind of what your experience was like uh, from the student perspective, as well as from your own kind of how many students you were sharing uh, and interacting with at any one time. Yeah, so we originally utilised this as part of one of our welcome week activities, um, partly because this was obviously when one of the lockdowns was still in place and we weren't really quite sure as to what was going to be able to be feasible in terms of space and kind of numbers of people we could have together at one time. Um, so we use this for our forensic students as the welcome week activity and apologies for the glare that's coming up the side of my face there. Um, and at, at first, I, I think a couple of them were in slight disbelief. Um, they were like, I can't believe I'm going to be playing Dungeons and Dragons as my first activity at university. Um, and that obviously shows that those students did have previous experience with tabletop RPGs. Um, and we've actually found a relatively high proportion of our students have some background in TTRPGs. So some of them already have these accounts on, on likes of Roll20. Um, but they found it very useful because they could have the videos on, they could have the microphones on, they could interact with each other. And it was a, it was a good icebreaker activity for a lot of these students first meeting each other when we used it in Welcome Week. Going forward from there, we've then utilised it for a couple of replacement um, sessions from replacing from face to face to virtual sessions for crime scene investigation. And um, so I have shared it the one map I've shared five times with five different groups with five users per map. Um, and those users are able to go in once I launch the game and share the link with them. And they are able to go in and interact with the map in their own time as well as in real time. So I can be there, I don't need to be there. So if I'm not there, that's when I can make use of things like the text prompts on the screen to give them case information, to set them out tasks that they need to perform, um, or to kind of let them know why they're there and um, performing that investigation in the first instance. So the, the feedback has been very positive um, overall for this. Um, like I say, some disbelief from some students, I, I think positive disbelief. Um, I think they were quite relieved that this was gonna be something that they could do. Um, and I think it's opened their eyes um, for a lot of them. You know, they might now get into tabletop role playing games and socialising with their peers um, and, and kind of taking some of these interests outside of, of just the virtual classroom. Absolutely. And um, I think, you know, maybe it might be more uh, learning experience for uh, the, the staff than it might be for the students to actually yeah. um, get used to, to using yeah, these. Ab absolutely. Platforms. And, you know, I, admittedly, I have a big geek nerd background. And um, so I have previously dabbled with Roll20. So I didn't come in as a, as a completely fresh user. And um, so I have been through the Roll20 tutorial. I've, I've created some maps and stuff before. Um, there is a lot of information there, particularly on the Roll20 tutorial, but hopefully from that little demonstration, you can see just how quickly and easily if you can get a good copyright free floor plan that you can just paste that straight in, make it the size you want, a few tokens on it and you've got a crime scene you can play with straight away. Um, so it is very accessible. Please don't feel intimidated um, by all of those boxes and all of that text. Almost all of it can be left as a default, completely fine without any um, negative repercussions whatsoever. Fantastic. And also, I wondered um, kind of what some of the learning objectives or some of the tasks you could share with us about how the students have utilised it since uh, or following their Welcome Week activity. Yeah, it, it's interesting when they first come in, obviously, for Welcome Week, a lot of them, their, their only experience of CSI is really what they've seen on the TV. Um, which which I know we all hate. 
Um, so it's interesting because you can you can let them run wild um, and they can do what they think they want to do and what they think is going to be useful and they can verbalize that to you. So they say, OK, I'm moving over here. I'm going to look for this. I'm going to collect this and you can question them. You can say, well, why? Why is that important? What's that going to tell you? So it gives you that really good um, opportunity for feedback. It improves their communication skills, getting them to verbalize kind of what their thought process is um, and kind of why they're doing things instead of just doing them. Um, kind of going forward as they've built a little bit more, obviously I'm looking for their scene considerations, making sure they're setting up things like cordons, speaking to first attending officers, looking for their evidence maximization, so how they're going to protect the scenes, what they're going to prioritize and, and kind of how they're moving and really just trying to get all of our, um, our first year students to get away from there's a body I'm running towards it. So it, it's good and that's I, th I think that's why things like the fog of war can be useful and um, I appreciate using the fog of war as an extra step and um, you by no means need to use fog of war. But I think it does help and um, prevent that feeling of becoming overwhelmed or being too drawn to the body in the big pool of blood straight away. They've got to be much more methodical and work from the front door and, and kind of go from there. Absolutely. Have you used this in terms of assessment yet? And Not in is terms there of like a practice? link that you might be willing to share with us so that if we wanted to create our your own account and and just see from like kind of offline from a student perspective what it might be like to actually um explore the scene and and to play with it from a, a user perspective yeah absolutely um user accounts are completely free to make on roll20.net and um, so you don't need to have a premium account a free account will allow you to do everything that i've just demonstrated um, by all means, I am absolutely um, fine to make a scene and I will um, share a join link for that scene um, and I assume we'll be OK to disseminate that through the, the mailing list, perhaps, um, yep. and, and people can jump in and, and they can have a play on that scene. Um, and by all that means, you know, I'll, I'll put some tokens in and, and people can use it. From an assessment point of view, no, we've not utilised it for any um, formal assessment yet. Um, certainly we do use it from a formative aspect and um, so kind of, you know, students can come in and they can get feedback as if they were working a, a crime scene that would have been face to face anyway. Um, but in terms of, you know, for a final grade, we've not used it for assessment yet. No. No, that's that's fantastic. And, you know, if you do or if you um, kind of expand upon the, your use of it and you get maybe students to uh, share ideas with you or create content um, that are then used by other stu students or, or peer groups, those kind of things, you know, let us know and, and we'd be it'd be great to, to have you back and to, to see how you're progressing. And yeah. the same with Katie as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's something that's that's really important and something that I do want to build on with the students is, you know, we've, we've toyed with the ideas of instead of me creating scenarios and them assessing the scenes, they create scenarios for each other. Um, and, you know, once they get familiar with these tools of Roll20, instead of just typing out their scenario, they can build their scenario. Um, and, you know, kind of um, thinking back to the very first kind of real versions of this when people would make little dioramas and kind of little shoebox houses of of crime scenes you know that that's essentially what they're doing they're they're building whatever they can imagine really and um, but just using this free virtual tool to do so no that's fine